Hello and welcome to Quilting with Bernina Walking Foot number 50. I'm Julie Bridgman, Bernina educator, and today we're talking all about the walking foot. I am here with Emily Hall. She is our monitor today. If you have any questions during the webinar, go ahead and put those in the questions pane and she will save those for the end of the presentation. So the walking foot number 50, what comes in the box? First, let's go over what is in the box. So we're gonna take you over to my close-up camera here. And in your box, you should have the walking foot like this, and it will have the sole on it, one of the three soles. You will have two other soles that are not attached. Now this sole here, I'll start with the center guide sole. It has this metal, metal blade right in the center of the sole. This one here is your standard sole. And then this one that's attached to my walking foot here is the open sole. You can see there's more visibility down the center here. Also comes with a left and a right seam guide, a collar to attach the seam guide, and this little screwdriver. The collar goes on the walking foot like this. You loosen this screw in the back and you go ahead and put one of the seam guides through the holes. And you put that all the way through and then you tighten the screw here. And I'll show that um, in a little more detail in a bit. So how do you change the soles? I'll do a demonstration here on how to change the soles on the walking foot. You take your little screwdriver and you turn the screw that's on the side of the foot to the left. And what that does is it loosens this black bar here. So it pushes it out so that you can easily just slip off this sole. So see if we look under the foot here, this black bar is extended out more to allow that sole to come undone. Now I'll grab a different sole. And what I usually do is I attach it on one side and then I attach it on the other side, just approximately. And I start to tighten the screw, maybe just a couple turns. And then I wiggle it around until it just snaps in place. And that's all there is to it. And then after you're done with that, you just kind of wiggle it around, make sure that it's in there nice and solid. So really easy to do. And um, that's, um, all it is, that's all there is to it. So when you have your walking foot, if you've had one that's a few years old, you might have noticed it only came with two soles. So you can go ahead and call your local dealer and buy that third sole, which is the center guide sole. Also, this foot is one of the feet, the Bernina feet, one of the only feet that actually needs maintenance. So when you take your machine in for maintenance, go ahead and take your walking foot. How often you take it in kind of depends how much you use it. You use it a lot, just once in a while, um, but it is a good habit to get into is taking your walking foot into uh, the dealer, to the tech, and having them look at it once in a while. Okay, how do you attach this to the machine? So this requires a couple steps. There is that U-shaped fork on the walking foot. And this U-shaped fork, as you noticed in the picture on the left, it goes on the needle clamp. So what you wanna do, actually what you wanna do first, at the very beginning before you do this, is raise your needle to the highest position. So you use your hand wheel and raise the needle to the highest position. And then you can also lower your feed dog too. That just gives you a little more room um, there to work with. 
just remember when you start sewing to uh, move the feed dog back up. Now, once you've done that, take that U-shaped fork and attach it to the needle clamp as shown in the picture on the left. And then you wanna go ahead and attach the foot onto or into the cone, which is the same way you do with every presser foot is that goes into the cone on the machine and you lower that lever on the left side as shown on the picture on the right. So that's all there is to it. Um, a lot of times, if you're new to this foot, what happens is sometimes you miss that first step where you attach the U-shaped fork into that needle clamp and it's just resting on the top of it rather than the forks in between it so, or on either side of it. So if you start sewing and you notice something's not quite right, check the, the fork and the needle clamp. Okay, so applications. When would I use a walking foot? Well, the first reason you might want to use your walking foot is if you're sewing with difficult fabrics, such as pile fabrics like Velcro, or I'm sorry, velvet or corduroy, or as in the picture, that terry cloth. If you're sewing with bulky fabrics, such as fun fur, and also if you're sewing with something bulky, you might want to increase your stitch length to three. Uh, if you have a slippery fabric, such as satin or rayon, or a sticky fabric, such as vinyl, these are times where you might want to get out your walking foot. If you're sewing with fabric other than, say, a quilting cotton, and it's just not um, sewing exactly how you want it, it's a little fiddly or fussy, get out your walking foot and try that, and uh, you might be much happier using the walking foot. Uh, the walking foot has rubber gripper on the sole and what it does is this rubber gripper um, that is it's, I'm sorry it's not on sole it's on the foot what it does is it works with your feed dog to move your fabric evenly um, on all layers so if you're having a problem with uh, fabric and that's different than what you normally use and it's not quite sewing evenly, try your walking foot. That should make a world of difference. Another reason why we might use a walking foot is for multiple layers. Um, the, again, the walking foot has a rubber gripper on it and it works with the feed dog and it moves all the layers evenly. So I like to use my walking foot when I'm attaching my binding onto a quilt top. So I do a lot of traditional binding where I stitch on the binding on one side, on the front side, and then I turn it over to the other side and I hand stitch it closed. And so that's one way I use the walking foot a lot because with binding, sewing on binding, you're working with five layers. You've got your two layers of binding, you have your top layer of the quilt, you have your batting and then the backing. So that's a lot of layers to feed evenly. Um, so that's uh, one way that I get out my walking foot quite a bit. I'm gonna show you a made to create video that we do. These are 60 second videos that our education team does. And it's uh, me sewing on my binding using the walking foot onto my quilt top. And um, these are not meant to be tutorials. They're not meant to follow along. They're just quick videos and that will reference you to our We All Sew blog that has the step-by-step -step tutorial. And if you're not familiar with We All Sew, that is Bernina's creative sewing blog that you will find a wealth of information, everything Bernina, Bernina products, and a lot of tutorials on sewing, garment sewing, quilt sewing, um, sewing, different sewing techniques. And um, that is wealso.com. So let's watch the video.
So another reason you might use the walking foot is when you're sewing with directional fabrics, such as stripes, plaids, or directional prints. So on my picture on the left, you'll notice that the stripes didn't quite match up exactly. That's with your regular presser foot. And then the picture on the right, the stripes are right on. And that is with the walking foot. So with the regular presser foot, the bottom of the sole is smooth. And what's happening is the feet dog is moving the fabric at the bottom, but the top, the top fabric is just going along for the ride. So that's why it's not quite matching up there. You get your walking foot out and this is going to move the layers together evenly. Because remember the walking foot has the rubber gripper in it. So that solves that problem and it looks great. Another reason why you might use the walking foot is for directional quilting. This is actually the reason a lot of people buy the walking foot is for directional quilting. Um, and there are different kinds of directional quilting. The first one we're going over is stitch in the ditch. This one, we are going to use the center guide sole. So this is, in the picture you'll see, the center guide sole is that sole with the metal center blade. It's got that metal blade in the center. And what you do is you stitch on the seam line and it's going to be in the ditch. So I like to press my seams to one side. And when you do that, you have, it creates a ditch. So, and then the seams that are, or the side of the seam with the seam allowance in it, that's called the loft. And uh, like in that picture, you'll see that blade is in the ditch. And that loft is created is where that binding is. And what happens is that center blade, naturally it goes in the ditch and then your, the needle is right behind it and it's creating the stitch right behind it. So that stitch goes in the ditch, to, which is exactly what you want. Also, there is channel stitching. And channel stitching is when you are doing straight lines and they're all equidistance apart. So with channel um, quilting, you either use temporary marker or you can use painter's tape to create that first line. You need some sort of guide to create that first line in the center. So you always start in the center and then once you create that first line, you can use your foot, the side of your foot, like shown on the bottom picture, or you can use the left or the right seam guide, depending on how far apart your lines are. And then that will create your channel stitching. So what you do is start in the center, and then you create your channels going one direction, so all to the right, for example. And then you go back to the center and create your channels going to the left. And if your channels are about a half inch, you want them say half an inch or so, you can use the side of your uh, walking foot. If you want them an inch or more, you're going to use that seam guide as a reference. Here are some variations with channel quilting. So channel quilting, it doesn't just have to be straight lines, although that's pretty cool, depending on what your project is. I have a picture of Sunrise Baby Quilt, and this is a tutorial that's on weallsew.com. And you can see she's got channel quilting in there, but she's created it in a V formation. So the channels are forming a V. And then the picture on the right is pretty cool because the channel quilting is in the colored fabric. It's not in the background fabric. And because the fabrics are crossing each other, she um, quilted it like that. So at the intersections, you get more of a grid formation. So it kind of creates a second uh, quilting motif. So I'm gonna go to the close-up camera now and show a couple examples. So here I have a sample of Stitch in the Ditch. 
Now, when you first look at this, it doesn't look like it's been quilted at all. But if I turn it over, I, you'll see I do have my stitches, but they're in the ditch. And <clears throat> that's how this walking foot works so beautifully because you can't even see the stitching, which is what you want for stitch in the ditch. So again, this center blade here is going to go right against, it's gonna butt up against this seam here. This is in the ditch and then all my seam allowances are the lofts right here. So it goes right there and my needle is stitching right behind it. And I, when I used to do stitch in the ditch before I got this burning a walking foot, I was never that happy with the results. But since I've been using this foot, I just love it. Now we have some channel quilting. And here I can show you this way here is where it's about half inch. And when you're right here, you can use the edge of your foot as a guide. Then when you get more to an inch, or more, you're, you'll need to attach, oops, you'll need to attach your uh, left or right seam guide when you get more of an inch, an inch or more. Here's half an inch and you can use the side of the foot as a guide. And then here I have, this is about a half inch channel quilting and this is on a patchwork piece okay now let's go over match stick i'm sure if you've been looking around different quilting blogs especially the modern quilting you've heard a lot of reference to the match stick quilting and this is a form of channel quilting but they're very the lines are very close together uh, as close as an eighth inch apart. So to do matchstick quilting, you would first start with your channels about half inch apart. So you can, again, use the guide or the side of the foot as in the picture as a reference and then do your half inch channels. Then you wanna go back and you can use the marks, the quarter inch marks on your foot and do lines in between those channels to make your quarter inch channels. And then if you wanna go even tighter, you would go back and do your eighth inch marks. It is really easy to do. It just takes a lot of thread and a bit of time, but it creates a really cool effect. So on my picture there of the heart pillow, that's the time where I might like to use do some matchstick quilting because matchstick quilting makes a really dense, firm fabric. Um, and so I think it's great for a pillow front because it gives it that um, structure. So, and then I have some variations here. I found a silky thread block. Blog has this kind of cool effect where they did the outline of someone's name. So they drew the name with a temporary marker and they did the matchstick quilting around the name. And what ends up happening is whatever is not quilted pops out, <clears throat> pops out because that matchstick quilting is so dense, whatever is around it that's not quilted just pops. On the right side is a matchstick quilting, but they're using a thicker thread and a, a color thread that um, contrasts with the background fabric. So that creates a really neat effect also. Okay, so let me show um, this one, my matchstick quilting here and how I did this. So you can see these are really close together. One side I've got a white thread on and on this side, it's a little more subtle because it's uh, blue thread that matches the fabric. Um, but to give you a rough idea, first I went ahead and I did my half inch channels. And then I went back and see how here, the if I match up the quarter inch marks on the foot, they line up with the channels and then I stitched 
this middle line here. So now I've got my quarter inch channels. And then I went back and these, see how this quarter inch channel falls nicely with, within this sole. And I can just use those lines as a guide to stitch what will be these eighth inch marks. So it's really, really easy, just a lot of thread and quite a bit of time, but simple to do using the walking foot because you've got all the markings. The only thing you have to mark is that first line. And this, you can see, is a lot, it's really firm. There's a lot of texture here. And if I bring this sample back, this is the one inch channel, it's, it's, it's very um, loose and flexible compared to this. Okay, so let's talk about the crosshatch or grid. There's different, lots of different variations in doing crosshatch or grid quilting. You have straight, diagonal, angled, curved, and uneven. And you wanna think about spacing um, your lines. So think about what you're trying to achieve for the particular project. If you want to create more texture, then you want to use you, you want to place your lines less than half an inch apart half an inch or less if you are trying to create a motif create put your lines an inch or more apart um, on the picture on the left is a diagonal cross hatch i think that's about an inch inch and a half apart the picture on the right is your uneven cross hatch so it, it's more of a straight grid, but I say it's uneven because the lines aren't um, equidistance. There's some that are closer together than others. There's also radiating lines. This is when you take one, you have one point on your quilt top and you have all the lines meeting at one point, or it could be two points or more. The points are usually on the side, in the corners, or the center. And depending where that meeting point or points are will change your design. So on that top picture, I have the point at the bottom in the center, and it kind of looks like sun rays. And then the bottom picture, my points are in opposite corners, and it gives more of a diamond effect. Um, and the other variation you can do with this is when is how far apart those lines are. The top picture I measured about an inch apart. And you start, you actually, you don't start at the point, you actually start at the top, create your dots about an inch apart or your marks about an inch apart, and then you sew to that point. Um, if you have more than one point like the bottom picture, then you will sew the point to point. So why don't I go over that, those two techniques before we go on to the um, next one. So here's my crosshatch. This is diagonal. It's about an inch apart. This one is angled. This is an angled crosshatch. So first I went ahead and with my walking foot, I did straight lines. And then I turned it and I did an angle. So depending how much your angle is will um, change the look of the top. This is uneven crosshatch. This is straight, but the lines are various distances apart from each other. Here is my radiating. And again, I made marks an inch apart at the top. And then I use my walking foot to guide me all the way to the center point here. And then here is the one that looks like a diamond. And this one, you want to make your dots in the middle. So you can kind of see where I had them here. And your goal is to sew to that mark in the center from one 
um, point to the point on the opposite corner. Okay. So now let's go on to dot to dot quilting. You might have heard this term dot to dot quilting. It basically is what it sounds like. You're making dots and you're connecting them on your quilt top. And th and this kind of technique can create thousands. I mean, the variations are endless. So you can either start by drawing a grid, use your temporary marker, draw a grid, or you, if you have a quilt top that has um, blocks that are all the same size, you can just use your piece blocks as the grid. One piece of advice someone gave me that I found super helpful was do not look at the needle when you're doing this. Always look in front of the needle or always look where you're going. Don't look at the needle. So you wanna look, okay, where you want to go and your hands in the machine should do that work for you. So that was a good piece of advice that made a world of difference for me when I started this. Also, you wanna use your free hand system. You're going to do a lot of pivoting with dot to dot quilting. So make sure you've got your free hand system attached. Um, the picture there is kind of a star motif and it looks pretty complicated, but it was really easy to do. We also have the um, wavy or curved quilting. You can do something that's very organic and where you don't mark anything, you just go. And you can do really subtle waves or very exaggerated waves or both. Um, the picture on the right, you can see the waves are going in one direction and the picture on the left, they go in one direction, turn the quilt, go in the other direction so you get a grid effect. Um, so you don't always have, you don't have to just do straight lines with your walking foot. You can also do waves. Uh, another kind of wave you can do is a ribbon. And this is where you have two lines or two curves that are close together and it gives a ribbon effect. And then there's also echo, where you create one curve and you echo that curve throughout the quilt and it's the same distance apart. Uh, so let me show you some examples of that. This one here is my dot to dot. And again, this was really easy to do. It just takes a little, dot to dot takes a little more prep work um, by marking it before you actually get to the machine. This one is my organic wavy lines. So I didn't mark anything. I just did some subtle curves, various distances. And then this one is the ribbon effect. So you see how I have two lines two wavy lines close together. And they're all about an inch apart. I didn't measure it. You can measure an inch apart um, to get a better feel for it, but I didn't and uh, it's just, I wanted it to be very organic and look very natural like that. But the key with the ribbon is to keep the two lines close together. And then echo, is going to be something like this top portion here. So I did one line and then I use the side or the edge of my foot to create the rest of the lines. Or if you want them more than half inch apart, you'll use your seam guide. The other side, I turned my quilt and I did another wavy line to create a wavy grid. So lots, lots of options. Okay, so now you also have decorative stitches in your machine. So don't forget about all those decorative stitches. You can use them with your walking foot. Your walking foot has a needle opening of 5.5. So you can use your decorative stitches up to 5.5 millimeters. Um, some of the popular choices for quilting with decorative stitches is the scallop 
and the wavy decorative stitch. The scallop, I'm, I use a Bernina 790 and my scallop in there is number 719. The wavy um, stitches, there's three of them that are in my quilting menu, um, the quilting stitches menu, which is on the machine screen. On the right side, there's the quilting stitches um, menu. And then my, I have three wavy stitches in there. So check those out, depending on your machine, um, the place or the number might be a little different, but those are popular. Of course, you can use any of the decorative stitches. Uh, the picture on the left there is of the scallop and the picture on the right is the wavy. I referenced we also.com quilting with the walking foot. Uh, that is a great post. It goes over uh, the wavy stitches also. Um, and also with the wavy stitches or any of the decorative stitches, you can echo or you can just do random. So if you want to echo the stitches, what you have to do is make sure you always have a starting line. So wherever your starting line is, you always want to make sure that you press pattern begin and that stitch is always starting at the beginning of the stitch. Because when you do decorative stitches and you sew and then you stop and then you sew again, it's just gonna start where you stopped. You need to press pattern begin to start exactly at the beginning. And that's just if you want to make sure your stitches are all lined up evenly to do echo. Okay, all right, before we go on to this tension, let me show you my last few samples here. I have the, uh, this is the decorative stitches. So here on this side, you can see they're just random. I just, I didn't press pattern begin. I just stopped, went back to the top and stitched. Here I did echo them. So I always started this top here. I had created a line with a temporary marker and I made sure I always hit pattern begin to start. Here I made a sampler with decorative stitches and I put on this side the number and the stitch length with anything I wanted to notate for future reference. But I made a little sampler of stitches I might want to try for quilting. And if you have orphan blocks, Oh, I know every quilter has orphan blocks hanging around. It's a great way to practice um, quilting with the walking foot. So I had an orphan block here. And what I did was I played around with the dot to dot and created the center motif here. So I had my dots. This is kind of like the sample I showed earlier with the diamond effect. And I used my piece um, my piece block to as my grid and then I created my dots here they're about a quarter inch apart and then I stitched like this and I just kept going all the way around and then I did that with each line and then here I did some channel stitching so I'm going to play, play around with this I've got a lot of other orphan blocks at home I can play around with decorative um, or quilting with my walking foot. All right, so tension. I get a lot of questions about tension. So with the walking foot and quilting, you want a balanced thread tension. For, ordin for stitch ordinary stitching, that means the needle and the bobbin thread should be locked in the center of your material. So that would be in the batting. If you find that um, the tension on the needle thread's too tight or if the bobbin thread's too loose, that means in the picture in the middle there, you're gonna see your top thread laying flat. You need to loosen the top thread tension. If you find that you're having the opposite where the picture on the bottom, your bobbin thread is flat, you need to tighten that top thread tension. So with the walking foot, if you are using a 40, 50, 60 weight thread, you should not have to make any adjustments. 
if you're using a thread, say a 30 weight, something really thick or something really super thin, like a hundred weight, then you might need to make some minor adjustments. Okay, so I just went ahead and referenced a few things for you. We also.com, I've already talked about a bit. Go ahead, check that out. There's so much information on there and lots of tutorials. We have the Bernina Big Book of Feet. And that is this book. The walking foot is in here, along with all the other Bernina feet, around 100. So if you're someone who um, collects feet or might want to, or just wants Want someone who just wants to look at the different feet and decide what they need or don't need, although I think you need all of them, um, check out this book. It'll be at your dealer. And this one, it's, this one talks about the feet. It has pictures. It talks about all the different parts of the foot. And it talks about what you can do, all the different sewing techniques for that foot with details, stitch length, stitch width, any adjustments, and um, with great pictures. So lots and lots of information in here. We also have the big book of machine quilting. So this goes over a lot of what I talked to today, about today, but it also goes over free motion and other kinds of quilting. So this one's fairly new, and um, this is also available at your dealer. Also for directional quilting, I referenced Walk, the book Walk by Jackie Gearing, and she has a second Walk 2.0 that just came out. And those are great books if you want to know more about directional quilting. She goes over a lot of what I talked about today, the dot to dot she called point to point. Um, those are two, two books I recommend. And some of my samples were inspired by her book. So, okay, I think I have covered a lot about the walking foot and what you can do with it. <laughs> Emily, do we have any questions? Okay, can I talk about the needle threader with the 880? Okay, with the walking foot, you cannot use the needle threader with the 880. You can use it with the other machines, but not the 880 because it has that automatic threading. Okay, attaching the seam guide to the foot. Sure, I can show that. Why don't we go back to the close-up cam? Okay, so here's the walking foot and I've got the collar. This is called the collar. And it goes on here like this, okay? And then you want to loosen this screw there and you take either one of the seam guides and it goes through this hole. So you basically are going to push this all the way through. And if you're finding that it's not going all the way through, you might need to loosen this a little bit more. And then it's going to pop out the other side. Let's loosen this even more. There. And then you tighten this. Just, but don't tighten it all the way yet because what you'll do is you'll take this to the machine and then you attach this on your machine and then you decide, okay, where, where do I need this to be? Make your adjustments and then make this really tight until it stops. And that's all there is to it. And if you are sewing and you don't need it, you can, what I do if um, I know I'm gonna use it again soon, I just pop this up a little bit to get it out of the way. I don't like take it off if I'm going to use it again soon. Okay. Okay, so in the sample with matchstick quilting, do I bury my threads when I stop? It depends. Part of it depends where you're stopping. If you're stopping somewhere where you're going to um, like sew over, like if it's in the batting where you're going to put your binding, 
you can just sew right off that because you're going to stitch that binding over those um, stitch lines. If like in my sample where they had the name, someone's name, I, I don't, I think they, they might have stitched around those letters. But if you want, if you're doing something and you need to stop and start somewhere else, you can always, what I do is I always pull my bobbin thread up and, um, and then I leave my thread tails long. And then if, but if you don't want to do that, <laughs> if that's too many threads for you to pull, you, you don't want to pull them all to the back and tie them, you can use your, uh, there's the securing function or do a little back stitch. Um, I guess it's, it really comes down to a preference. There's a couple different things you can do, whether it's tying the tails in the back or doing a securing stitch. And it kind of depends on what your preference is, what the project is, how, notice a, how notice a, noticeable it will be in that particular area. Yes, I use, I use this um, water erasing styla by Soline. Um, it basically, it marks and then it comes off with a little dab of water. I like this one a lot, uh, but again, it's preference. This is my, my usual go-to. Um, I, I don't want to say that, oh, can I find the wavy stitch on any or all of the machines? And I, I don't want to say they're on all of them because I don't know. They're on a lot of them, but I can't say that they're on all of them. Um, so just check your manual or your um, just go into your stitches, whether it's in the decorative stitch menu or the quilting menu and look in there. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you learned a lot about your walking foot and um, ha happy quilting.